Okay, hello, welcome. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, the presentation of Luc Ferreboeuf. Uh, sorry, maybe for the bad French pronunciation, but uh, he will present why we need to redesign internet to fight climate change. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce this presentation as Luc Ferreboeuf is, is not only one of the experts of the D4S, the Digitalization for Sustainability, uh, but he is also one of the leading people in the French think tank, uh, the Shift Project. Um, so, and you published, I, I think it's four, four years ago or something like this, a very well appreciated <laughs> report which was also going to a lot of media and press and it was bringing a lot of attention to in particular to the video online video topic and was bringing the discussion also to netflix use and and uh, this kind of stuff so this was coming from this uh, shift project and he was uh, the person behind so i was well aware of your name since quite a long time, but I had never the chance to meet you. So, uh, so now I hand over to to you, and let's. And uh, at the end, you you plan some some uh, time for for questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, perfect. It will make things easier. Um, so, yeah, why, why we need to redesign the internet to fight climate change? It's, uh, it's, it's I already used this title in some other presentations, in some other contexts, and generally people are puzzled. Um, why are, are you asking this question? Why should you ask it in this way? I think after three days of uh, Bits and Boim uh, conference. It doesn't sound so peculiar. Um, and <clears throat> we'll see uh, especially um, why the, we have at the moment actually some systemic uh, causes behind the fact that uh, the digital environment footprint um, is not going in the right direction. And uh, one of these uh, systemic causes is uh, um, not only the big tech, but the big tech business models. Uh, and so that's the purpose of this presentation, is to explain why it is the case. Um, I'd like to say that uh, part of these results, you will be able to find them also in the D4S report that we presented on uh, Friday and Saturday. And because there is a chapter on the uh, business models, and also, uh, there should be a specific paper published on that in a few weeks uh, with all the, the details uh, behind. <clears throat> um, so, as, uh, as that it was said, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to make a presentation that should, uh, that should last for about 35-40 uh, minutes. And then we have some time for questions and answers. However, uh, please, uh, in the course of the presentation, uh, do not hesitate to ask questions for clarification, not for discussion, but if I've said something which is not clear, please say it. Uh, that will be uh, more efficient. So, <clears throat> let's start. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, as it was said, <coughs> um, the SHIP project and actually myself, we did work on a number of reports. Uh, not going to, to come on them all, and the first one is uh, on, the, on the left, and that's the one that raised some attention from the media. I must say also that probably one of the reasons one of the reasons why it raised some attention from the media is because it was published just one week after the IPCC 1.5 degrees report. So we were uh, leveraging, actually, uh, an existing um, 
context that was quite favorable. Um, <clears throat> as the last report we published in the Shift Project uh, was last year, and that was both an update of um, the uh, uh, prospective trajectories uh, we built out in 2018, and also some thinking uh, about 5G governance, uh, or more generally about new infrastructure governance. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, um, I, I would say uh, one of the things we are quite proud of in the SHIP project is that uh, probably we contributed to the fact that um, digital uh, sustainability uh, has become a topic uh, not only for environmentalists in France, but uh, it has become a law uh, since there's been a law passed in 2021 called uh, the law for the reduction of the digital environmental footprint. Um, and we didn't try the law, of course, no? so it's, it was a long process. Um, and, but part of these reports were contributors. Uh, and also two other reports that actually I, I did myself, <clears throat> one for the French Senate and one for the uh, High uh, um, Council for the Climate. So, <clears throat> and maybe even more importantly, um, digital uh, sustainability has now become uh, a regular topic um, within the association of the uh, top French companies, IT managers. That's the one in the uh, uh, digital sobriety. Um, so, um, and that has triggered the fact that now a number of companies are trying to understand how to still manage the digital transformation, but while uh, trying to uh, limit the environmental impacts of this transformation, and also trying to make sure that this digital transformation is going to serve their energy or environmental transformation. Okay, <clears throat> so that's uh, the good thing. However, <laughs> uh, I would say, <laughs> It's not because we publish reports that uh, the world is changing. Uh, and uh, when we updated the figures in 2021, we had to just to confirm that what we said in 2018 was still quite valid, actually. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and the reasons behind is that um, there are some systemic causes uh, behind uh, this trend. And to be complete, <clears throat> you, maybe you have noticed that uh, the title of the DeForest report uh, we published is Digital Reset. That means that after two years of uh, dialogue, we also, and I uh, would like to mention that I have a DeForest colleague, two DeForest colleagues actually, uh, Joanna, please, and Matthias, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, we came up collectively to the conclusion that um, trying to, uh, to make progress uh, through uh, marginal changes will not be enough and that we need a fundamental uh, reconfiguration uh, how, of how uh, digital uh, systems uh, are working at the moment. And that's why we call that digital reset. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what I'm going to say, um, just to slide on uh, climate change mitigation, and not want to make a speech about climate change mitigation, just to remember a few figures because I will use them later on uh, in the presentation. <clears throat> Explain rapidly, because it was I think uh, largely covered in these uh, BNB uh, sessions why digital is part of the problem, and I will try to spend more time on why the big tech business models is the root cause of unsustainability. So that means there are two things behind. Um, <clears throat> root cause is not only the big tech, but also their business models. That means if these were not the big techs, but all the companies with the same business models, we would have the same consequences. Okay. 
And eventually, uh, what is the way forward? Uh, how can we uh, make sure we get out of this situation? Uh, and what, what we should do? So, <clears throat> uh, and because I want to present these slides because anything I'm going to say later on, I'm not going to say it in absolute terms. I'm going to say it in view of the constraints we are going to face in the next 10 to 15 years. Okay. Because if we do not manage properly the 10-year period which is in front of us, well, <clears throat> the, the rest will become another story. Uh, and, uh, uh, and carbon neutrality in 2050 is nice, but the real objective for me is uh, being able to halve uh, the emissions uh, by 2030. Okay? And that's the consensus today, <clears throat> uh, given um, the fact that uh, decarbonation techniques or, or carbon capture techniques uh, are far from being uh, industrialized, we have to rely uh, mainly on the reduction of, uh, uh, of gross emissions. <clears throat> and uh, the benchmark for that is if we want to not to go too much be above 1.5 degrees, we should uh, cut by half the emissions by 2030. So, and that should be valid for uh, any industry sector, including digital. Second thing, which is very important and to my surprise, is, which is generally much less discussed, uh, is the fact that in order to be able to achieve this mid-term target, halving the CO2 emissions hmm, by 2030. Um, of course, we will have to substitute electricity generated through, uh, via fossil energy with electricity generated uh, via renewable energy. Good. <clears throat> Problem is, and we see that very much at the moment, uh, is that uh, the, um, the volume of electricity that we are going to be able to generate from renewable energy until 2030 is limited. It's limited because of our industrial capacity. It's limited because of the length, time it takes to install uh, electricity uh, plants uh, out of renewable energy, for instance, I don't know in Germany, but <clears throat> in France, uh, uh, installing um, um, <clears throat> uh, installing uh, uh, anything which is going to 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 let's say to 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 take things uh, out of uh, some people and could be uh, a nice view or something like that. Uh, you need 10 years, actually, to go through the process, okay? <coughs> so, my, my point, and it's not he who's saying that, the International Energy Agency has been saying it for three years. Uh, if we want to be able to halve CO2 emissions by 2030, we have to reduce, globally, the energy consumption by 2030, okay? And uh, in, on average, we need to reduce it by 7% between 2020 and 2030. And the effort needs to be higher in developed countries. For instance, in Europe, it is 15%. Okay. So why, why, I'm, why am I um, stressing uh, on this point? Because any uh, carbon neutral strategy uh, that does not also include a strategy on how to reduce the energy consumption is not going to work. Okay? It might work maybe on a local basis, 
but it, if it works, it would make things more difficult uh, on a global basis. Okay. <coughs> so that means that also on the digital side, the digital energy consumption at least should not be increasing. Okay. So, if, yeah. I have one you said, uh, uh, on the last slide. Okay. slide. So, the energy needs to reduce, but this applies. Sorry, this, um, the, this is showing an increase in electricity generation, but the total energy supply, like heating it's energy and stuff like that, yeah. that's, that, that reduces, but the electricity use would be going higher, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. electricity is going to increase, but the total energy supply must decrease. Hmm? And that generally is the missing part of the speech. Hmm? Okay, so <clears throat> rough figures, um, digital uh, footprint today between uh, three and four percent. Okay, so higher than uh, uh, airline industry, um, but maybe more importantly. Um, GAG emissions are growing at a rate of about 6% a year. Okay, and so 6% a year is, is about exactly uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 um, the contrary of what we should be uh, targeting. Uh, we should be targeting for minus 6% a year if we want to divide emissions by two. <coughs> and it's increasing uh, by 6%. Okay. So, <clears throat> that's why I said at the beginning, the trajectory is not on the right path. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the footprint, clearly the footprint due to uh, end-user devices uh, is the largest part, about 75%. It depends on the countries, actually, but on a worldwide basis. Uh, and within this part, uh, the production part is very important. The, um, uh, the, the carbon which is embodied in the equipment uh, during the production phase uh, is um, generally higher than what is going to be generated during the use phase for an end-user device. Okay? For a smartphone, uh, it's about uh, 85%. 85% of the carbon footprint of the smartphone, if I, if I keep it for three years, uh, is the emissions which were generated when it was manufactured. Okay. And that's again a worldwide average because um, when uh, you manage to uh, reduce the carbon intensity of the electricity, the carbon emissions of the use phase are going to decrease. You keep the same energy. And so therefore, the proportion of the uh, production phase is going to increase even more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't show it there, but uh, if you looked at any of these uh, components, you would say that all of them, actually, their contribution to GHG emissions or to energy consumption is increasing. There is no one, uh, uh, no one component which is especially responsible, I would say, for uh, the growth of the digital footprint. So that's one thing. <clears throat> Second thing is, uh, of course, uh, when you produce more, and if you have not in place uh, uh, a circular economy, well, uh, you get more materials uh, at the end uh, of life. Uh, so in 2019, there were about 55 million tons uh, of um, electronic devices that were, let's say, um, going somewhere. And I'm saying that like that because we actually know where this somewhere is only for 15% of the 
of these uh, 55 million. The rest of them is a gray area, uh, but a good part of this gray area is something like that, which is in Ghana, <coughs> and where ultimately uh, these electronic devices end up, and where people uh, will try to, to, to get out of them what they can. Uh, and of course, uh, with a lot of um, prejudice, both to, uh, uh, to the health of the local populations and everything. So, not a very nice picture. And so, <clears throat> and uh, I don't know if you, if you attended the, 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 the DFRS report presentation, but. Uh, uh, Lawrence uh, Hilti, who is one of our colleagues, explained that um, if we are in this situation, it's not at all because uh, there is no, not enough uh, progress in terms of energy efficiency. No, uh, probably the, the digital sector is the one with, which has been making the most progress in terms of uh, energy efficiency in the past 15 years. <coughs> And you can see that, for instance, when you, you see uh, actually how many computations you can, uh, you can do <coughs> uh, per uh, kilowatt for the different uh, generations of uh, processes. You can see that each generation uh, is almost uh, bringing a progress of one order of magnitude compared to the former one. <coughs> So, if, uh, if we have this uh, growth of uh, environmental footprint, not because of uh, energy efficiency, it's just because we have too many digital volumes. And you can see that on this, uh, on this graph. Actually, <clears throat> the uh, CO2 footprint is going to result uh, from uh, uh, the product of the energy consumption coming from digital and the carbon intensity of this energy. Okay. Then the, the energy consumption is going to result from um, how many people are using digital, and this is increasing but slowly now uh, in the past few years. Uh, but more importantly, it's going to result from what is called here energy intensity of technology, which means in um, practical terms, how many uh, uh, end-user devices you own per person, uh, how much uh, tra uh, data traffic uh, you are uh, generating, uh, how long you are keeping uh, your existing devices, and so on and so on. So, <clears throat> uh, sorry, this, what I said is related to technology influence. <clears throat> Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, actually the factor which has been increasing uh, the most. And I must say, I um, don't have time for that, but I can answer the question in the end. I must say where it has increased the most is also where it is already the largest. In other terms, in, um, <clears throat> in the US a few years ago, uh, there were about eight digital devices per inhabitant. At the moment, there are, there are about 13. Okay, so 55% uh, increase. On a worldwide basis, <coughs> uh, probably there has been an increase, but only of 15 or 20%. So, where there is already a, a very high usage of digital is also the places where. Um, the um, digital uh, technology influence uh, is increasing uh, the fastest. And that's some examples. <clears throat> so here on the left, uh, you have uh, what is called here the stock or the installed base of uh, digital devices. So we have about, at the moment, about 20 billion digital devices installed in use in the world. And if we believe the analyst, the sector analyst, uh, we should have close to 50 billion 
50, 50 billion devices in 2030. So more than doubling <coughs> in 10 years. Uh, and uh, another example is uh, the growth rate of the traffic uh, in the mobile networks, which is uh, on a worldwide basis uh, on the, on the <coughs> past three years um, in the range of 45%. 45% a year. Okay. That's just huge. And as you can see, again, according to the analyst, there is no, there is no thing which says that uh, this trend should stop in the near term. And of course, what is true for the install base is true also for <coughs> the uh, sales of new equipment. And uh, at the moment, we are selling about 4 billion uh, digital devices a year and probably be selling twice as many uh, in 10 years, uh, which means that between now and 2030, we will sell about 70 billion digital devices. Okay. And if we have 7 billion people on the planet, that means 10 per person. Okay. Um, and what's going to happen, what is happening on the, in the digital world is that um, the, the, at, at a given time, you have a, a number of different equipments that are in use. And then some of these equipments uh, become less popular, but actually before they become less popular, you have new types of equipment which uh, arrive and which are actually uh, a new growth driver for uh, the vendors of uh, digital devices. And that's what is happening at the moment with the uh, Internet of Things, where we actually we are going to equip virtually any non-digital um, thing with a digital module to uh, make sure that it can be connected to the internet. So, <clears throat> um, there's been a lot of discussion about, but why we, why do we have that? Uh, Ah, it's because um, people want new services. Ah, it's because um, um, the vendors, uh, they are still in the linear economy and so they need each year to sell more devices than before, <coughs> and so on and so on. Actually, it's a bit more compl complex than that. <coughs> there is a lot of interactions now and digital is already so much present in our daily lives that um, <laughs> Actually, the dynamics uh, behind these, uh, these trends that I've described uh, are very uh, complicated. So it has really become what can be called a systemic uh, issue. <coughs> and <coughs> some characteristics of this uh, systemic issue um, the first one is very important, that probably even you, maybe probably a few things uh, uh, in what that I said, you didn't know them. For instance, who knew that uh, a smartphone like this, its cardboard footprint is about 80 kilo? Who knew that? Okay, two people out of 30. And I think you are probably more informed than the average citizen on these type of things. Yeah. So there is a complete unawareness uh, of the uh, sustainability aspects of our digital things and usages at the moment. Okay? 
So there's nothing, maybe it's a bit uh, trivial example, but when you have a car, okay, uh, and you decide to go, um, in, in Germany you can do more, but uh, you, can, you decide to do 130 on the autobahn uh, rather than 110, then when you have to go to the gas station, you will see that you need to, pit, to put 15% more gas uh, into your tank, so it's 15% more expensive. So after a while, maybe you decide, okay, maybe I will not go down to 110, but I will go down to 120. So there is, a, what I mean is there is a feedback loop <coughs> that uh, helps you to regulate your car usage. At the moment, there is no feedback loop at all in digital, especially with the fact that a lot of services now are either offered for free or seem to be offered for free, <coughs> or they are uh, offered for a fixed sum and then you can consume as much as you want. So, there is no, um, no mechanism in place that is there to facilitate this uh, self-regulation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> on the enterprise side, and I feel a bit guilty about that because I was uh, one of them uh, not so long ago, the, the companies have been briefed uh, by uh, digital vendors on the fact that well, to achieve future growth, they need to uh, transform digitally and they need to do it faster than the competitor because if they are late, they will lose market share. Yeah? And we've been quite effective actually <coughs> because now every company almost is uh, working on its uh, digital transformation and they have associated so much this digital transformation effort with, let's say, uh, future profits or even uh, uh, the future of the company. If we don't do it, uh, we are going to lag behind and maybe we won't exist in five years' time. <coughs> uh, that it's not natural, not, not natural at all for them to, f to think or to admit that this uh, digital transformation could be detrimental on the environmental side. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and, and then the third thing, um, a, bit, a bit the same phenomenon. Uh, policymakers are very worried about anything that would prevent digital to grow because they think that it could affect negatively uh, the, uh, the GDP uh, of the country and the growth of the GDP. Okay, <clears throat> but there is one other root cause uh, which I'd like to comment uh, in more details today, <clears throat> which is the fact that the big, big tech models that rely on uh, audience maximization uh, is actually intrinsically incompatible with sustainability. Okay. <clears throat> so, what makes things worse is that uh, these big tech are completely dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's 2020 figures. 2021 figures would be even more threatening. But the, the total um, <coughs> market capitalization is in the range, was in the range of $10,000 billion. And as you can see, uh, these big tech uh, are virtually the top 10 companies in the world. Okay, by market capitalization. <coughs> so, uh, so anything they do is going to have a major impact and anything they want is also going to have a major impact because they have a lot of power to achieve it. And uh, this dominance actually 
we can find it also on the almost on the physical side of things. <coughs> uh, in 2021, six companies have generated 57% of the total internet traffic in the world. Okay, 57%. Six companies. And in some countries, it's even worse. I don't know in Germany, but in France, it's probably around 70%. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, and that's the, the, the market share, okay? But if you look at what has been going on in the past three, four years, you will see that actually these six companies are responsible this time for 75% of the growth. So virtually, not only they drive the market, but they create the market. And you, you can see the same thing on the smart speaker market, where they have actually 70, 80% of the market share. And <coughs> the prob um, their dominance has a lot, creates a lot of problems on the um, competition, uh, um, privacy, societal uh, uh, consequences, and so on and so on. It's not my point today, but <coughs> it creates also a lot of problems on the uh, environmental side, and why? Because actually, they are probably one of the few companies in the world whose uh, revenue energy intensity is growing. So what is the revenue energy intensity? It is actually the energy a company needs to generate uh, one euro of revenue. Okay. And what is happening is that each year, for instance, uh, Google is going to use 4% more energy to generate this euro of revenue. Okay. And why am I saying uh, that they're probably one of the very rare companies that are in this situation? Because in the past 10, 15 years, uh, the uh, revenue energy intensity at uh, world level, which, which means uh, the, the, the energy intensity of the worldwide GDP, has been decreasing at about 1.5% a year. Okay? And <clears throat> it's actually something which is necessary if we want to be able to reconcile as much as possible economic growth and uh, reduction on environmental footprint. It's called decoupling. Okay? So here, it's not at all decoupling. It's uh, decoupling in the other way. Each year, it's getting worse, actually. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and why is that? Um, how, for instance, uh, does Google uh, make uh, most part of its revenue? Well, what they do is they have a lot of users which go on their platform, Google, YouTube, and so on. <clears throat> and uh, when you go there, well, Maybe you can provide some personal data, but you also provide, without knowing it, a lot of behavioral data. Okay? And these data, uh, Google are going to use them uh, in order to build some information that they, then they will be able to sell to third parties that will use this information to uh, try to sell services and products to you. That's their business model. Um, <clears throat> and so, what is the, uh, what's going to make them successful? What is going to make Google successful? It's its ability to attract as many users as possible on its platform and to make these users stay as long as possible uh, on its platform. And how can Google achieve that? Well, it can achieve that by making its platform always sexier, always more attractive than other platforms, 
And for that, what are they going to use? They are using, going to use data. They are going to use videos, especially uh, at the moment. Probably virtual reality in a few years. <coughs> okay. So they are going to use actually uh, some data as materials to uh, build an environment that is going to make you stay as long as possible and to come back as often uh, as possible. And, <clears throat> and each year they need to, to enhance this environment to make sure that it still remains attractive and more attractive than alternatives. Okay? And they do that, uh, when they do that, they actually, uh, they're actually responsible for uh, a huge uh, augmentation of traffic. You see, 42% a year for Google, 60% a year for Meta Facebook. It's, it's, it's gigantic uh, growth rates. <coughs> so, <clears throat> uh, the, then the, the consequence uh, of these uh, business models uh, is that not only it's going to increase their own direct energy consumption, okay? the direct energy consumption, what it is, it is their data center's energy consumption. Google's energy consumption is increasing uh, at, by 25% a year. 25% a year. Okay. Uh, so it's increasing a bit more rapidly than its revenue. Okay. And they, they, do, they, they have that uh, even though uh, their data centers are probably the most efficient in the world. Okay. So again, it's not a problem of energy efficiency, it's a problem of affluence. Now, <clears throat> since uh, especially two years, a lot of these big tech have announced to the market, no, no problem, we have plans to become carbon neutral uh, it depends on 2040, 2030, then. but don't worry, <clears throat> we are going to uh, cut our emissions. And <clears throat> uh, actually, when they do that, they uh, are only speaking about what is called scope one and scope two emissions. I don't know, are you familiar with this? Who is not familiar? Okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> when you try to establish uh, the carbon footprint, for instance, of a company, uh, you have several, let's say, scopes that you need to investigate. The first one is uh, how, many, how much fossil energy are you consuming directly? Means with uh, your cars, with your trucks, uh, uh, you, with your central heating, if uh, you use gas or petrol and so on. Okay. Scope two is basically how much electricity uh, do you use? <clears throat> because we know that electricity is still, 60% of electricity in the world is still produced out of fossil energy. So consuming electricity at the moment uh, creates emissions. So that's scope two. <clears throat> and in many countries, companies uh, are obliged to measure and to report only scope one and scope two. Okay. Well, so what is scope three? Scope three is actually, <clears throat> um, in the digital world, especially two important things. It is the carbon footprint of the equipment you are buying, because you have not produced them yourself, hmm? so it's not in your scope one and scope two, but you are buying it. And there is, as I said, a lot of embodied carbon in this equipment. And the second uh, important uh, subscope, if you want, uh, is the 
emissions that are going to be um, uh, emitted uh, by the services or the products you sell when somebody is going to use them. Okay, because in scope three, we consider yeah, the company should be responsible for the emissions that are going to be due to the usage of the services and products they sell. <clears throat> and in digital, it's very important <laughs> because uh, scope three depends whether you talk about data center company, telecom operator, and so on, but scope three is generally 10 times as big as scope one and two. Okay? So, <clears throat> when Google and the others say, we're going to divide uh, emissions, uh, we're going to be carbon neutral, and if you remember, that means that we have to divide emissions by half uh, by 2030, they are talking about scope one and scope two. Okay. So, time is running, so I'm, uh, I'm not going into all the details, but I guess you will have the, the presentation. Um, <clears throat> if you do the math, you will uh, come to the conclusion that indeed, even though they will keep having uh, the electricity consumption grow at a pace of 15 to 20 percent a year. Okay, if they do equip, for instance, all their sites with uh, renewable uh, with, uh, with renewable uh, plants producing their own electricity, which is Google is doing at the moment, uh, they will indeed uh, manage to reduce their emissions. But in the meantime their electricity consumption will have uh, increased uh, enormously, you see. Uh, at the same rate, it will go from 70 terawatt -hour to almost 350. Okay, so multiplication by five. Uh, but it will be also true for the rest of the value chain. Well, the rest of the value chain is, also, is not only the um, energy that's going to be consumed by you and me when we are going to use uh, Google services, but also the energy consumed by the networks that are necessary to establish the connection between the user and the Google data center, for instance. Okay. <clears throat> so the rest of the value chain, uh, of course, the energy consumption is much bigger. It, in, it will increase a bit less but it will still increase uh, and all, almost by a factor four. And actually the results are, they are right. The scope one and scope two uh, will be reduced by 50% if they do that. Even though they will have uh, multiplied the energy consumption by five, okay? But in the meantime, the carbon footprint of their value chain, that means their scope one, scope two, and scope three, will have increased by 50%. Okay? That means that there are two comments. One is, for the reason that I described, their, their business models and the, the, their growth profile is inco incompatible with sustainability constraints. Uh, two, the, uh, let's say, sustainability plans they have announced make us believe that they are not anymore a threat. So it, they can use that to legitimate the fact that they can keep growing as they have been growing. Okay. So it's a double threat because actually, yes, they will be able to show they were right, but in the meantime, they will have continued aggravating actually the, uh, digital, the uh, environmental footprint of the digital sector. So as we have only five minutes left, so, what can we do? Uh, well, I think, as I said during the DeFerrest presentation, <laughs> the first thing we have to do 
is to make big tech smaller. Because if we don't do that, uh, of course, we can push and we can support alternative uh, initiatives and alternative platforms. But I went to several workshops on these uh, in the past two days, and what I heard is that it's very difficult at the moment because they are fighting against uh, giants, uh, and also it's very difficult both to receive enough uh, financing and also enough, I would say, publicity to help them uh, become um, uh, just to, to become them a viable alternative. Because hmm? if you don't know they exist, you're not going to use them. So, <clears throat> the first thing we need to do uh, is to um, make sure that uh, the big techs themselves become smaller, and that's uh, competition law and so on and so on, and maybe the continuation of the DMA, DSA regulations in, uh, in Brussels. <clears throat> but it's also making sure that their business models, uh, as such, are going to be uh, made less attractive. And that's about data uh, regulations, and it's also about sector regulation. Uh, and for instance, we, we should not, we should, uh, we should avoid these uh, dual-sided uh, markets. Uh, where actually some players manage to externalize uh, a large part, both of their costs and both of the financial and environmental costs, <clears throat> but to the detriment actually uh, of the rest uh, of the society and of the economy. So, <clears throat> um, probably it's, it's a very limited list, but one way which seems quite interesting to me is the idea of cooperative platforms, especially in Europe. So we can think about, uh, let's say, cooperative uh, startups that from the start adopt uh, uh, a pure digital model, but with a, a cooperative uh, legal arrangement. But we can also see the 200, 220,000 uh, cooperatives that exist in Europe and see how they can transform digitally and become themselves platform, but remain cooperatives. Okay. It should not be so difficult, actually, in my mind. The, all the technology is there. Uh, these cooperatives, at least locally, uh, are well-known players. Uh, they have customers and so on. So, just have to make sure we, they have been provided with the tools to become more efficient and maybe to upscale uh, their operations. <clears throat> so, that's the, the alternative uh, we should be pushing for. And as I said, uh, the public policies which are needed First is uh, to make big tech uh, smaller, <clears throat> um, uh, but also, I mean, the, the, the hell is in the details uh, on that. For instance, when you first go on, uh, on Facebook, let's say, you're being asked uh, whether you agree on the terms and conditions uh, for the use of the service. But of course, 90% of the people are not going to read in terms of condition. And if you do that, you will have uh, very long pages of legal uh, terms. And after a while, I said, OK, I'm, I'm going to accept. Uh, but actually, <clears throat> these terms of reference, what do they do? <laughs> they establish a contract between you and them. And it gives them the, 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 the ability and the right to use uh, the data you provide for free in the way they want, basically. So we have, and it's very difficult to, 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 let's say, to check whether it is, uh, uh, what is exactly in place. So <clears throat> I think we have to enhance the existing data regulation and forbid the acquisition of personal data by default. That means there should be an explicit authorization <clears throat> on a detailed uh, set of data 
uh, that should be given. And also, last but not least, uh, we have to make sure that the technical architecture of the web is going to evolve according to, um, to uh, directions that will make all those things easier. Uh, and especially uh, giving the ability to each individual user to have, I would say, physically, the full control uh, of their data. Okay, sorry, I've, I have been a bit long, but if you still have some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, yes, I guess we have time for, for maybe two, two, three questions. Hi there, Chris Adams, Green Web Foundation. I have a question. Are there any other sectors we can learn lessons from to address some of the problems you described about a small number of very, very powerful players or people having something they had for free that they might not want to pay for? Because uh, there, are, there are other sectors who've had to deal with the same kind of consolidation of power and influence previously. Mm. I'm not sure I have the answer like that. Um, I think one difficulty we have with digital is that um, it's a sector where um, technology and usages are changing very fast. And it, may, and it makes a hard time for policymakers because they're always behind. They are still trying to fight uh, the battle before the last battle. But the new, um, the new war is coming, and they have not seen it yet. Okay? And uh, I think we are going to see that with the metaverse thing, um, which is full of problems. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not sure we can really uh, derive any lessons from uh, another sector. Another question? It's too late. One question. So on the, on the last slide, you uh, mentioned Web3 as one of the options. Mm. Uh, I find that very interesting because Web3, I um, would uh, connect to the blockchain industry uh, decentralization in that direction, which I don't think is less energy consuming than what we already okay. have. And I think there are alternatives that actually exists uh, there's something called small web which is exactly the counterpart to web3 which then uh, goes like degrowth in in that sense uh, yeah so no, maybe I, you want to comment the, the web3 on yeah this, no, so. i used web3 in a generic term because there are still a lot of different approaches of web3 um, <clears throat> uh, no i will and uh, and we should uh, certainly avoid uh, with Web3 to create, uh, I mean, to, uh, to create uh, n new monopolies in the place of uh, other monopolies, <laughs> certainly. Um, <clears throat> no, I, I was saying that as there, are, uh, there is work in process on how to evolve the uh, arch internet architecture, um, these principles should be uh, at the core of the redefinition uh, of the architecture. Now, uh, is blockchain a solution or not, and which type of blockchain, uh, and how can blockchain uh, and help? That was one of the many technical questions that sh should be resolved, uh, but it should not be seen as a religious uh, option. Thank you. Another question? Maybe one last? That's not the case. So, once again, big applause and thank you very much for this nice presentation. So